All right, Bill, we're going. Well, I did, uh, introduce yourself, Bill Strait. All right. My cousin. Yeah, so it's, it, we're sitting out here on my deck in Circle Pines, Minnesota, and it's uh, June 25th, is 20, it? 24th, 2022. 24th. It's about 90 degrees, but we're sitting in the shade. Yeah. It's not too bad, it's and nice. we're sipping iced tea. Yeah. Palmer's. So Donald is here because he is interested in some of the research I did last year and the year before during the pandemic on our family history. Yeah. Um, his last name is Fisher. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm and I'm seventy, and Bill Strite is seventy now. Seventy. We're now. both seventy. We're both seventy. Yeah. Super. We used to hang around together when we were kids. Yep. But anyhow, um, so from so, my research, Donald's now interested just, in. Just learning. say he. So Bill's mom and my dad were brother and sister. So Bill Fisher on this side, Aloysius and 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 Fisher Strite. East. East. Yeah. East. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Now we got that squared. All right. So this story starts with our great, great grandfather. Um, let's see. Where do I have that guy's name? His name was Carl. Carl. And he was born in 1789. Uh -huh. Carl had a son, which would have been our great grandfather. And his name um anton was no, no uh let's see yeah it was anton anton, anton. okay so an, so the story really is about anton no he's got quite a history yeah. he was the one who was born in stetson switzerland back in 1828 and he ended up having a life in stetson switzerland i don't know what to do it's, it's kind of a flat land the mountains are about 50 60 miles away uh, the Alps, but Zurich is only 20 miles away, and it's he's probably only 10 miles from the Rhine River, so you could almost consider it like the Rhine River Valley area. So it was farmland, um, but that's where he grew up. It's a small village, but and when he became, well, he got married to Pauline Zender, and Same. she was born just a few eight years after he was, but they got married in let's see, I wrote it down. She was from Dottenton, Switzerland. And where is their marriage? Well, they got married in their 20s, let's say. I don't know the exact date. But when Anton was 49 years old, for some reason he decided, well, by that time he had four girls and two boys in his family. And he must have been having a tough time in Stetson because he decided to leave. And he emigrated at that point with his wife and six kids. And they ended up landed in Eden Valley, Minnesota, and that was in the year of oh, what time? What year was that? Um, 1885 Eight? is when they came over. Wow. With all his kids, you know, six kids. So they settled in Eden Valley on an 80-acre farm, and which is not a lot. And in Eden Valley, there's there's a popular lake called Rice Lake. They were probably about five miles from that or less. Um, but they were 20 miles away from Avon, and that's kind of important. Um, I don't think Anton was making it on this 80-acre farm with his six kids. Um, so he had skills as a blacksmith, and he hired himself out, I think, to the locals as a blacksmith and, and made tools and fixed tools. So the railroad went out to out west from Minneapolis and St. Paul in about 1870. And so he's living out there uh, in the area a little after this time. But w with the railroad, the engines had to have, every six miles they had to take water on and, and pick up wood to burn. Six miles? About six miles wow. to eight miles. So on the route from the Twin Cities out west, every six to eight miles there's a little town on this railroad track that went out. You know, J.J. Hill and whoever else, Great Northern, they had a little town. And one of the little towns that was set up was just west of St. Cloud was called Avon. And in Avon, there was a, a water stop. And with that water stop, it started growing. People started s coming to that spot because the train had to stop. And if you wanted to go west or go to the Twin Cities, you'd go to that water stop and get on the train. And I don't know, they probably charged you a little fare to take you, but that was the popular way to travel. 
So a lot of the immigrants came on that train and were dropped off in this area. And that's probably how our grandparents uh -huh. got here. They, ended up they probably ended up in St. Paul and came up on the train and, and got off in Avon and found this little spot. Um, I don't know, they gave land away free back then, you know, to the settlers. So they probably got this little plot. And, uh, but he didn't make it, I don't think, as a farmer. So he worked as a blacksmith. Well, Avon needed help. And I got, I found a book that talked about the history of Avon. And in there, Anton is mentioned quite often. Even though he's 20 miles away on a farm, he became very important in the early stages of Avon. Avon was incorporated right around 1900. And in, let's see, I wrote the date down here. In um, 1903, um, Anton was made a street commissioner for the city of Avon. He, at that time, was 74. Oh, wow. And he worked for the city then as a street commissioner until two, a couple of years. Then they promoted him to the city treasurer. And in 1905, so by this time he's 76 or so. He continued to do that for another five years as a city treasurer and retired from that at the age of 82 uh, in 1910 as the city treasurer of Avon. And the city continued to grow because, well, back then, just north of there was a town called Sox Center, northwest. Sox Center was the largest city in Minnesota. Really? In, in 1875, with the train, yeah. Wow. It was the largest city in, one of, in Minnesota, or one of the largest. Minneapolis might have been bigger, or St. Paul, but it was like one of the second largest, or the largest oh, yeah. at that time. Bigger than St. Cloud. Eh? Had a thousand people living in it. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was all because of the train and drop-off spot. So, yeah, Avon was just south of there, and so that's kind of the history with our grandfather, which is, is or, or great-grandfather. Right. So our grandfather, who is Yosef, Yosef, was his son, and he was born over in Stettin also in the year of, uh, let's see, where did I write his date down? Uh, 18, well, 1828 was Anton. Yosef, oh, you know, I don't have you. Oh, 1871. Oh, 18 so Yosef was born in 1871. And... When he came over here, he was a teenager, maybe 12 years old when they emigrated, because they came here in 1889. No, uh, eight, what the date did I say? 1887. So he was six years old. Sorry. So our grandfather was six years old when he left Switzerland and s settled in with his dad at, in Edinburgh. Well, as his dad is doing these blacksmithing s skills, he must have been going into Avon and working for some of the large farmers there. And one of the large farmers was a guy by the name of Gunringer. And he's important because our grandmother is a Gunringer, Katie Gunringer, which was his daughter. And I'm going to switch now from the Fisher family to the Gunringer family um, for a little bit. And then we'll, when they get married, we'll continue on with the story. But with the gun ringers, they emigrated here in 1888, uh, about the same time that Anton came over with his dad. Or eight, Anton came over with Yosef. Uh, they got a 280-acre farm oh, wow. in Avon, <laughs> right outside of Avon. And their big crops were potatoes, I think, at that time, and could still be. They still have a farm out there, or they did have a farm not, oh, really? not too long ago. Yep, gun ringer farm. But he had three sons and five daughters, this gun ring, yes. And let's see, the oldest one uh, son was Peter, and he's important. He was born in 1871. And so he was born in Germany, or, or I think they came from Germany area. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the gun ringers came. It's either I thought Luxembourg. They... Yep, I thought they came from Luxembourg. Okay, it could be from Luxembourg, yep, but in that area. They came from yep. Luxembourg, yeah. So they came from Luxembourg in that year, and then <clears throat> Peter was the oldest, and then he had another brother, and which I don't really want to get into. He had five daughters, which we get into a little bit. Um, one of the daughters, the oldest one, was Mary. She was born in 1881, so she was... Uh, 
seven years old when they emigrated here and got on their farm. Um, let's see, how can I speed this up? So, oh, here it goes. <laughs> so around in the end of the eight, 1890s, um, Anton is going into Avon and finding blacksmith jobs. I think Nick Gunringer hired him to help make tools for his farm, large farm, 280 acres. Well, guess what? Yosef, his oldest son, is about 20 years old, 25 years old, and looking for to get married. Well, Nick Gunringer's got five daughters or four daughters, all in the Marian age, you know. So he, they talked, and he said, "Hey, Anton asked asked uh, uh, Nick Gunringer, hey, would it be okay if my oldest son Yosef uh, married your oldest daughter Mary?" And the rumor is, is that. Uh, Nick Gunnery who goes, you know, Mary is pretty sophisticated. She's well educated. She's been to Europe a couple times and a business lady. And, you know, she might be a little, you know, more than, she might not be a good match. It'd be better to, Katie, the younger sister, would probably be better suited for him. So they go, okay, well, let's try that, you know. So Yosef met Katie and Katie met Yosef and they hit it off. And here Donald and I are because yeah. that worked out. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, we would not be here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they got married in 1899. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah. Um, which was a booming time back then, I guess. Lots of our history, early history oh, started. 1899. That rings a bell because our oldest uncle, Aunt Tony, uh -huh. was... We all remember he was born in 1900. We always knew his age because he was born in 1900. Oh, yeah. So, so he was the first grandson so first, of that marriage. Yeah, so that yeah. makes sense. All right. Continue on, Bill. All right. So <laughs> they get married, and they go back and live in Eden Prairie on this 80-acre farm. Oh. Or Eden Valley. I said not Eden Prairie. Or Eden Valley. And they were there for, I don't know, five years or so. And it was just getting too crowded because they kept having kids, you know, by... <laughs> By they ended up uh, needing more room. Well, this Mary, we call her Aunt Mary, Aunt? that originally Yosef wanted to marry, um, she never did get married, and she had a, a fair amount of money. So she suggested, or Katie asked, if they could borrow some money from her to buy their own farm. There was a nice farm that went up for sale in Luxembourg, which was 20 miles away from Eden Valley, or 50. As a crow fly, it was probably only five miles, but as a road, you had to go about 20 to get there. And it wasn't that far from Avon either, so they went and looked at it. Yeah, this would work. Yeah, I'll loan you the money. So Aunt Mary loaned them the money to buy their farm. And that's the farm Donald and I knew as yep. we grew up. They still had the farm in, in the 1850s when we were kids. And 1950s. we showed up. And they still have the farm. Oh, I think they might have just sold the farmhouse this last year. Oh. Uh, one of our uh, first cousins who still owned the property, uh, Norby. Norbert. Yeah. yeah, I think he finally cleaned it up, and they remodeled it and modernized it and sold it. Oh, really? I think, okay. yeah. So it's been sold now. But Norby still lives as a next-door neighbor right next to the house, and he still has, I think, the property. The, oh, he does. That farm, yeah, or most of it. So anyhow, he... Um, they got married and settled in there, and Aunt Mary was the person who helped out. Um, what was important about this this new farm was it was only a block away from the church in in Luxembourg. And as um, Anton, who was working in Avon, he retired, remember, at 82, but he was still pretty good health. But in the winter, he liked to go to daily mass. And where his farm was in Eden Valley, it was too far. He couldn't get to the Eden Valley Church. It was too far to go in winter. You know, it was five miles or ten miles. Well, his grants, her son only lived a block away from the church in Luxembourg, so he asked if he could live with them. So during the winter, our great-grandfather lived with our grandfather in Luxembourg so he could attend church every day during the winter. And our father, or our grandfather, was the maintenance man for the church. He kept the church clean, was the foreman over there. They also had a grade school, and I don't know if he was involved with keeping that up too, 
but that was one part of his job besides running his farm in Luxembourg. And I don't know. I, th I don't, what was the Luxembourg farm? One hundred and sixty acres. You know, I don't. I don't remember. I don't think. I know it wasn't any bigger than that. No, it that might have be only been eighty. Eighty. Yeah, I'm thinking eighty, but yeah. I don't know either. But it, the <clears> nice <throat> thing about that farm was it had a creek running in the back that had trout in it, and we never knew that, or I never knew it until we got older. And I think there's still trout in there. Oh, really? Yeah, still a little creek that runs through there. And I can't remember what they named called the creek, but um, so anyhow, let's Katie, who is our grandmother. And they had, I don't know how many, nine or ten kids. We have nine or ten uncles over should, on that side. We, we should know, but yeah. I'm not going to get into that part of the, right, right. To the, to the story, but let's get back to this, the, the gun ringer, Aunt Mary. Yeah. Um, yep. So She's there's a why story. We're here. <laughs> there's a Talking. story here. So after yeah. she didn't marry Anton, or no, Yosef, she had another suitor, and I think it happened probably before uh, uh, Yosef got into the picture. Uh, a, a suitor by the name of Nick Weber. And Nick Weber had a farm in the area, or his family did, and so he knew the gun ringers too. And he liked Mary. Mary was well, a popular girl, it sounds like. And he uh, would show up at their house, and she didn't like him. So he kept, he was becoming a pest. So one day he was knocking at the door, and her older brother Peter was there and said, Peter, you know, I just don't like this guy. He's just pestering. He says, oh, don't worry. I'll take care of it. So he goes to the door, and she hears some arguing. The next thing, she hears a gunshot. And she runs out there. Peter shot Nick Weber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. It didn't kill him, but he's wounded. And so anyhow, the train happens to be coming through at this time. And they, they discuss it and said, Peter, you need to get out of here before they throw you in jail. So Peter grabs his stuff and hops the train and heads out. And then Mary feels really bad, you know, so she goes over to Nick Weber's house. He's recuperating. She says, you know, I'll marry you, Nick. You know, <laughs> she wanted to marry him so he wouldn't prosecute her brother. And Nick says to her, this is a story we hear. He says, I would never marry a woman whose brother would shoot me. <laughs> So they never got married. <laughs> and Peter's out in North Dakota. And and there's a history there. But let's keep on with Mary. So Mary ends up working for a priest as a priest housekeeper. Uh, in, settled in Cocado, Minnesota. And she became a spinster. Never got married. Um, when she was 46, all of a sudden there was a knock at the parish door. And she looks and the guy is really familiar. It's Nick Weber. Well, what the heck's he doing here? He goes, oh, Mary, yeah, I came to see you. See how you're doing? I heard you were out here. And, and yeah, I had gotten married, and I lived in Iowa. But my wife died recently, and so now I'm single. And um, I was just checking on you to see how you're doing. You know, well, I'm doing great. You know, good to see you. Come on in. You know, and, Well, they hit it off. And not long after that, they get married. <laughs> so then she doesn't need to be a... A housekeeper anymore because he's got a farm in Iowa well instead of going back to this farm in Iowa he must have had bad memories of it and didn't want to go back there even though he's got a relative back there he decides let's go to you know maybe we should go to San Diego everybody's going to San Diego you know winters are nice out there so they go okay let's do it so I think I don't know if he was an insurance or he was a farmer but I don't know how they all of a sudden decided to go to San Diego but they do and, well, Mary talks her younger sister into coming out and taking care of the priest. And she had twin younger sisters, and one of the younger sisters was not healthy. She had, I think, diabetes. And I don't recall if it, if it was Mary or, or no, there was Margaret and Anna were the two twin sisters. One of the two had diabetes, and and... Anyhow, they asked her to stay with the priest and do the priest, help the priest do his, his ministry there in Coquito. Well, because she wasn't feeling good, they, they decided maybe we could get Rose Canning, who is um, a, a niece of Mary and, and let's say it was Margaret, the sister. They asked her, Rose is our aunt. Actually, it was Rose Fisher. Rose Fisher, yeah. Yep. So she was a niece of Mary and Margaret, and she lived in Luxembourg, and she at the time was maybe 12 years old or in that area, and 
they were going to have her come out and help, you know, run the parish with this sister who was not feeling very good. Well, that lasted for a year, and then school started, so she had to come back. Well, the next year, they, Rose didn't want to go back. So then my mom was next in line, Anne. And Anne. so they asked her, and she, oh, yeah, I'd love to go out, you know. So my mother went out, and she hit it off really well with the priest and Aunt Mary. She said it was the best time of her childhood. They had money. They would give her money so she could go Christmas shopping and buy gifts. And they never had money on the farm. <laughs> And she didn't have to go out in the fields and work. These people were educated. They had schools. And not only that, there was a lady, a young lady in the house who was maybe five years older, who was adopted when she was only three years old from the orphan train out of New York. And her name was uh, Blanche Valoy. So my mother became good friends with Blanche. She was about five years older. And she became good friends with Blanche, Aunt Mary, and Aunt Margaret, I think, was the one who took over, and with the priest. And she always talked about that her time there. She spent one or two summers there with them, helping them out during the summertime. Well, in San Diego, Blanche Valoy was going to school to become a teacher. And I don't know if she went to St. Cloud State Teachers College at the time. I could have been. But she was sent to private school and paid for by the priest oh, wow. during this time. And... The orphan train is kind of interesting. If you ever have time to read into the history of the orphan train, but basically they took they took orphans out of the ghetto of New York that were left on the street. The parents couldn't take care of them, and they would get them in an orphan orphanage, and then the orphanage would send them on a train to the Midwest, and they would get residences for these kids to live with farmers and help them with the chores. The farmers always needed more help on the on the farm. And some of these farms, if the wives were barren, they couldn't have kids or something whatever. So this was a way they could get help in. And then they get raised in a nice, wholesome Catholic family, not on the streets of New, New York, you know. So it was a very popular system. But they had to be very careful of abuse. They didn't want these kids getting abused. So they did watch it pretty close. But Aunt Mary and this priest adopted... Blanche Valois in 1903. So it wasn't much longer after then when our grandfather got married, to, you know, three or four years later, that they adopted this young girl. And then they raised her and sent her to private school. And you could see the records uh, uh, hmm. that they paid for her at private school and worked out good. Anyhow, when she graduated, she started teaching, I think, out in that area, but then decided, Aunt Mary said, she should come to San Diego. It's awesome here. So... What Blanche Valois packs up and goes to San Diego too and must have stayed with him for a while. She meets a guy by the name of Frank Weber. No, not Frank. Frank Ryan was his name. And <clears throat> Frank Ryan was, uh, I think, into real estate and other businesses. And they raised their family out in San Diego. Well, when the priest retired, where do you think he goes? He retired just like in four years later. He goes to San Diego. So now Blanche, Mary, and the priest are all back together from <laughs> Coquita, So They're all in San Diego. And not only that, the, the sister, who was also taking care of the priest, she goes with too. <laughs> and she, they all are living with Blanche now because oh, Blanche's boy. husband must have had some money. And they had a very nice house. And I looked it up. I, I've got addresses from Blanche Valois because... She stayed in communication with my mom over the years. Uh -huh. And in 1950, my mom made plans to go to California to visit relatives. And there's letters from Blanche Valoy saying, you're welcome to stay here. And the address is still on the envelope. So I looked it up on Google Earth or uh -huh. Google Maps. The house is still there. It's two blocks from the, from the ocean. And it's a nice English Tudor. Oh, just uh, like your lot. mom had in Yeah, St. solid Cloud. oak floors, beautiful looking house with a gated entry coming into it. it oh. And I'm going, oh, this this house is probably worth a million or so out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so anyhow, that was Blanche Valois house. And uh, Mary and Nick Weber must have lived close by too. But there's a little confusion on the husband of Blanche Valois. His last name was Ryan. And he lived in San Diego. There's a famous Ryan um, out of... San Diego at that time, who 
developed the or, or started the first airline service between San Diego and San Francisco. And this guy bought a small plane, a military plane, put seats in it, converted it into a passenger plane, and started one of the first airline services out there. Um, this Ryan, though, was he liked designing airplanes more than owning an airline. He had a, a, a financier from um, New York that he met, and the financier, you know, was the one who financed the, the airline. Uh, and they both met in pilot school. They took a pilot you know, training lesson, and so uh, after a year or two, the their relationship fell apart. And so the Ryan sold his airline to the fan, to the financier, but they kept the name Ryan, even though he sold mm -hmm. out of it. But he got the money and he reinvested in, he liked to design and build airplanes. So that's what he, he kind of started doing. So he made all sorts of different types of prototype airplanes back then. And we're thinking there might be a connection between Blanche Valois' husband, Frank, and this Ryan airline guy. Because he gets really famous after the airline moves from San Diego to St. Louis, Missouri. And how he became so famous was, if you ever go to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., and you look at the Spirit of St. Louis, their first airplane to make a nonstop transatlantic flight by, what's his Lindbergh. name? Lindbergh. Lindbergh, yeah. On the back of the plane, it was built by Ryan Airlines. Yeah. And... So we don't know if we have a family connection there or not. You know, it would be through this adoption. But when I did my research, I ran into a gun ringer, and I told her this story. And she goes, oh, my God, we have a cousin who was best friends with the, who's the guy that flew again? Lindbergh. Lindbergh. They're best friends with Lindbergh. In fact, Charles. It, he was Charles's best friend oh. growing up. In, in Little Falls. And when Charles decided he wanted to fly across the ocean, he asked this gun ringer guy that we know to be his co-pilot. He was 19 years old. And he said he couldn't fly all by himself. He needed a navigator. So he just needed an extra person to kind of run, keep the plane up while he slept. And so this gun ringer came home and told his parents, you know, I want to, I want to fly with Charles over to the ocean. And they go, no way in hell. <laughs> Everybody that's done it has died. Yeah. And this was back in 1927, and people were trying to fly nonstop, and they're all dying. And now Charles Lindbergh wants to do it in his... He had this plane specially designed by this Ryan Airlines to take him across. But then when the parents denied this gun ringer kid to go with them, um, Charles called up and said, Hey, instead of putting a second seat in, add extra gas tanks. <laughs> and so he decided he'd fly it by himself with an extra gas tank and not take his friend. And so that was kind of a little tidbit of is interesting history that I ran into doing this. Huh. But let's see, so where are we going back to? Uh, we talked about, oh, Aunt Mary. Uh, so Peter, the older brother who went to North Dakota. Yeah. There's some interesting history there too. So Peter goes out there, and I, I wrote it down. He never did get caught. Never, and they never prosecuted him for the for the shooting. shooting. Him. But he ends up uh, homesteading a farm out there. And let's see here. The history on that was he married a lady by the name of Josephine Ruder. And she was born in 1871. Her, and they probably got married around this 1900 time also. They had a child... A lady who was called Frances, born in 1907. Frances was two years older than my mother. And so when Peter would come home to Avon to visit, um, my mother would often stop in and visit them because it was her grandparents. And my mom would go to Avon quite often because her husband, family, lived right outside of Avon. And their in-laws actually lived in Avon, and their last name was Grossman. So she would visit with the Grossmans, her in-laws, and then she'd also visit the Gunringers, which were her, I don't know, great aunt and uncle, 
uh, her aunts and uncles lived there. Yeah. And so she got to be very familiar with the Gunringer family. And she, I think she got to know this Peter Gunringer. And Peter's oldest daughter, who was two years older, they probably were playmates. And so they kept in touch over time. And uh, in 1957, my dad had passed away for a couple of years. She, my mother, who had driven out to California a few years later in this brand new Ford Galaxy, decides she could drive it by herself out to North Dakota to visit these gun ringers that she hadn't seen for a long time. But she is very friendly with. I mean, she, she would send, they'd send Christmas cards and keep in contact. And so she took us, the family, Rich, me, and Jane. Mm -hmm. Rich had just gotten his driver's permit. Oh. And so he would be the backup driver. And Jane and I were just little kids in the back seat. So there was a stop on the way in Moorhead to, they lived in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, which is near Bismarck, which is halfway across. So we stopped at uh, Moorhead the first night, and we spent time with our first cousins there, a Schlender. Mm -hmm. Al Schlender lived there. Yep. So he spent a night or two, and he had kids our age, so we played. And my mother really liked Al Schlender. He was very modern and very well educated, and so was my mother. So they, they hit it off really well. And we stayed there on the way in and on the way back. Um, but... Once we got out to Devil's Lake, um, where Peter had settled and married this, um, let's see, his first wife was, was Josephine, and she was my 20 years older. So my mom at this time is 50, and Josephine is 70. Well, we got pictures of Josephine yet. We got pictures back then of Josephine and of this uh, Francis lady. And so my mom loved it, you know, being out in that area. What happens is, interesting history is, they were in Devil's Lake, which was a small spot, and probably not real posture, they had a little farm. But this oldest daughter uh, of Peter's, uh, by the name of Frances, or uh, Josephine, she ends up, well, I change that back. She's the, the oldest daughter of Josephine and Peter. Her name is Frances, and she was born in 1907. She ends up, um, getting married to a guy by the name of John Voigt. And John Voigt's dad came from San Augusta, Minnesota, and he left about 1900 to go out and state a claim out west where they were still giving land away around Bismarck. And so he left his family in San Augusta, went out there, tried to find a, set up a little ranch. He wanted to do ranching, set up a little ranch, and he got to know the Indians, and they liked them. So the Indians said he could start his ranch on their land. And that was in Elbow, God, what the heck was it, Elbow, uh, Ellswood, North Dakota. And so he started his little farm there with the Indians' permission, and they liked him because every year he would slaughter one of his cattle and bring him meat. So he was really good friends with the Indians. And somebody said it was Sitting Bull. That was in the area too. And he was good friends with Sitting Bull because um, he fed the Indians during the winter time from his cattle, from his ranch. Um, the, the Indians weren't ranchers. They were, you know, the buffalo came around, they'd shoot them. And if they didn't come around, they starved. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of the buffalo were missing by the 1900s, so they were starving. And he fed them during the winter. So they were good friends, the Indians and him. Well, when the U.S. pushed out and took the Indian land, um, they then were able to decree uh, uh, land ownership to this John Voigt from San Augusta. And then he expanded his ranch. Um, the ranch, unfortunately, was too close to the Missouri River. And when they decided to do the Garrison Dam project, which was to dam the Missouri and hold back the waters, those waters in that reservoir flooded Ellsworth, Ellsworth, North Dakota, or their ranch. Really? The whole ranch? The ranch, yeah. Oh, wow. So the government gave them a check, said, your ranch has been condemned, here's money, you know, we're taking it, what are they called? Eminent domain. Eminent domain, yeah. Yep. So they got a check. So all of a sudden, his successful ranching business, he's out of, out of luck. <laughs> so... John's got all these sons, uh, Dwayne and, and 
his other son, John, who married Francis. Actually, it was his dad who went out there originally. So John, the son, married Francis, our, I don't know, we would call her a first cousin or second yeah, cousin to us. Like that, yeah. yeah, so anyhow, they get married. The farm goes getting flooded out. So they look around for another ranch, and they find one. They find a really a, a, a famous one called the Anchor Ranch, and it's on the Cannonball River, which is 60 miles south of Bismarck. Ellsworth, the first ranch, was about 60 miles north of Bismarck. Mm. So they ended up putting a bid in on this famous Anchor Ranch, which is on the Cannonball River, and it's probably about 15 miles from the Missouri River. And that area was famous because that's where the Mandan Indians lived. And so the Mandans are famous because they took care of Lewis and Clark oh. that first winter. They, uh, they were, it's a very interesting story. Lewis and Clark said, these savages are, not, are different than all the other savages we've met on the Missouri. These guys are civilized. He says, they're clean, they're washed, they live in groups, they, you know, they're, they're docile, they're nice people. As a community. And I think when they stopped, they were, in Mandan, they had like 15,000 or so Indians were really? wow. living in the area. And they, did, they were not nomad Indians, they were farmers. Huh. They farmed the, the Missouri wetlands, or what do you call those, the uh, flats, the mud flats, and they planted corn. Oh. And they had, they said, about 30 miles of cornfields around there wow. that the women would go harvest, and they would store it underneath their, they didn't have teepees, they had mounds. And the mounds were 40 feet across. And they were kind of like sod farm, sod things. They'd, they'd build a wood foundation underneath and fill it with dirt, and then sod would grow on it. But they'd have a little hole for ventilation, and they would be 40 feet across, and they would, you know, they'd be families of 10, 15 Indians in each one of these mounds. And at that time, there was like 20 or 30 or 40 mounds. There were a lot of mounds in that area. And that was the Mandan Indians that kind of saved Lewis and Clark that first winter because they had 30 below oh. temperatures. Uh -huh. Yeah, and they weren't, you know, they weren't used to that kind of nope. stuff. So the Indians were very hospitable. They took care of them. In fact, they would invite them into their places to sleep with their maidens. You know, that's how hospitable they were. They, <laughs> they thought it was an honor for uh, if a white man came into their thing and slept with their daughters. You know, so Lewis and Clark had to lay the law down to their 30 people that were with them and say, you guys are not crossing the river anymore. You know, you <laughs> guys are just colorting with all these women over here. This is not good. You stay on this side, other side of the river, which was where their camp was. But they did get to go over a couple of times for festivals. They had like the buffalo dance. And if you ever get a chance to read the Lewis and Clark Journal, it, the buffalo dance is, is very educational, very <laughs> interesting what they do. <laughs> but uh, so that's the history of that area. And this ranch, the Anchor Ranch, the guy that owned it was a uh, um, name of uh, William Wade. And William Wade came from Minnesota originally. And he got out there because steamboats were going up and down the Missouri and they needed wood. He was a lumberjack. And so he, as the woods got cut in Minnesota and cut down, there was no work. So they went out to the Missouri and cut trees along the river and stacked them up for the steamboats that came up. And so he was like one of the early settlers out in that area. And he became very friendly with the engine, Indians. He became a statesman for the state of North Dakota when it incorporated. Um, he was very well liked, and, and the Indians liked him too. And part of it was he was a little guy, but he could run really fast. <laughs> now, the Indians are very competitive. They like you know, basketball. And one of their things, they would like to run sprints. And so one time they challenged him, or there was a group of you know, these lumberjacks. They challenged them to a race. And so people were betting that this Wade guy who owned the Anchor Ranch, back when he was a young guy cutting wood, he could outrun, or the Indians were saying, they had an Indian that could outrun anybody. And, and these lumberjacks says, well, this Wade guy is pretty fast. You know? So it's okay, there's a challenge. The Indians are going to race this guy. And so they brought this guy in from Nebraska who could really run fast, this Indian. And they, they had bets on it. You know? <laughs> and so they ran the race. Darn if Wade didn't win. Oh. He beat the fastest Indian in the you know, around. 
And so the Indians really gave him a lot of respect because this guy can run faster than any of them. And they thought that was the best. So he became kind of a hero in that he became really good friends with Sitting Bull, who was popular. Sitting Bull was not part of the Mandans. He was part of the Dakota Indians and the Sioux Indians. And they were taking the Sioux land away from them. And, and this William Wade got involved with the negotiations between the U.S. government and the Indians. He had to kind of escort. They hired him as an escort to take him from Minnesota all the way across North Dakota to meet near, um, what's Deadwood? What's out near Deadwood, that town on the western end of the Dakotas? Big yeah. city. Rapid City. Rapid City. Yeah. So there was going to be a powwow with all the Indians in the area. And, and this was, I don't know when, the latter part of the 1800s. Um, and they hired this Wade guy to take the, the U.S. government party across North Dakota without getting killed <laughs> by all these Indians. Because there was a guy by the name of, oh, Tomahawk Terry or something. They had these names. that He was killing everyone. You know, <laughs> He didn't like white people. So they hired Wade to, to take this troop across to meet with the Indians and basically what they told them was yeah you don't own this land anymore we took it all oh, oh. Yeah, that's what they told them <laughs> and going oh this is gonna be good right yeah, it ain't gonna go over too well yeah so <clears throat> well eventually it did they they were able to get back safe and sound but Wade when he in 1925 he was retired and, and living on his ranch um, and it was a large ranch probably about 3,000 acres and he was had cattle on it. He, his daughter said, you know, you've got all these stories that are just great. Why don't we sit down and write them out? So they did. And so there's like a, a book she put together in 1925. It's about maybe 50 to 75 short stories of his memory of his early days in North Dakota. And almost everyone he went out there with died by the hands of the Indians. Oh, he was the only one who lived. <clears throat> um, he was well respected, but he became a very a state's elder for North Dakota and could have been governor probably, but never did. But he's got a lot of very interesting stories. And in the book, you can get it out of, uh, it's held in the library in Bismarck, but they'll send it to you. They've got, there's a couple of copies. They'll send it to you so you can read it. No online version that you know of? No. Oh, I got the book here, and what I, really, you know, what, you know, if I would have taken pictures of it and published it, it would have been copyrighted. Oh but yeah. But that book tells you the early life of of the settlers out there with the Mandan Indians somewhere. Wow. Um, so that yeah, was very interesting to read that little book. It's not well written, but the stories are very interesting. And everybody almost dies in every short story. <laughs> somebody's getting an arrow somewhere, or or if some mishap or disaster happens, some horse kicks somebody. So those are most of what the stories are about. <laughs> and it's very racist. You know, it's, oh. it's, not, it's not politically correct, but it gives you a good idea of the history back then. Anyhow, he dies in about 1927. His daughter then takes over the ranch. And in 1953, there was a couple of bad years, too much rain or something happened. And she was getting to be older. She wanted to get out of the ranching business. So she put the anchor up for sale, and that's the one that the Voights bought. Oh. And moved. They had to take their cattle 120 miles yeah. across <clears throat> North Dakota in 1953. Wow. And right now, you'll know there's Interstate 94 that runs right through there. And at that time, it was a main highway. <laughs> they had to drive their cattle across that to get it to their new ranch. That ranch... When they got it in 1953, was about three or 4,000 acres. When we visited, so when we visited in Devil's Lake, they told us, go down to the big ranch where our daughter lives. They got a lot of room down there. We'll meet you down there. And it's you can see this ranch. It's now 7,000 acres with cattle. I don't know how many cattle they had. So that's what we ended up doing. We went there, and they had kids our age. And so we played with them. They had the farm. They had the Cannonball River you could swim in. It was it was awesome. Well, they still own the farm. Now it's 30,000 acres. Uh -huh. And they have 15 head, 1,500 head of buffalo. Oh, wow. And they've changed the name from the Anchor Ranch. Now it's called the Voigt Ranch. 
Mm. And if you go online and do the Google search from the map, if you can find a city called Shields, North Dakota, there's nothing there. But back then, that's where they're, that's where we stayed in the little houses there. Currently, they've moved the headquarters of the Voigt Ranch to a different spot on the ranch. But right there was the headquarters back in 1959. Huh. And that, if you look at the, the, the satellite view, you're going to find the herd of 1,500 buffalo up into the north part of their ranch, their oh, property. Wow. So it's probably about 40 miles south of, of Bismarck. If you do the girl, you'll see a black, what's that little black? You zoom in on it. Oh my God, it's 1,500 at a buffalo. Oh. And they're kind of all herded up around a, a pen area where they must do most of their feeding and such. <laughs> but that's the history there. And and there's, are you videotaping this? Yep, it's still going. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I brought the books up that gave me a lot Should of this information. You can, I'll be right back. <laughs> 